Good morning, everyone. Um, very warm welcome to you all and um, uh, everyone joining the webinar. So um, for the past year, we have been tracking retailer performance across a, a number of uh, key categories, monitoring both the, the cost and the, the availability of um, healthy and unhealthy products within, within these categories. Um, the team here at the Food Foundation have been very busy and we've published 14 reports um, over the last year covering the Kids Food Guarantee. Our latest actually on Lunchboxes came out this morning. Um, and if you want to go into the detail um, of each of these each of these reports around the Kids Food Guarantee, head over to our dashboard. Um, uh, Someone will drop a link to that, hopefully in the chat now. Um, head over to our dashboard and you can really dig into dig into the detail. Um, but we felt that now that I mean, the Kids Food Guarantee has been going for about a year now, and we've just felt like that was um, a really good opportunity to take stock um, of um, what's been going on over the last year, look at retailer performance, um, and yeah, give a kind of broad overview and summary of our key findings. So yeah, today is intended to give you uh, an overview of um, each guarantee area um, and a summary of the findings. And we'll be uh, publishing a summary briefing as well um, at the end of the webinar. Um, so to talk you through our findings from the past year, we have um, the uh, <laughs> infamous, <laughs> not infamous, <laughs> Rebecca Toby, uh, <laughs> the Senior Business and uh, Investor Engagement Manager um, here at the Food Foundation uh, and our expert and very much the driving force behind the Kids Food Guarantee over the past year. Um, I'm also delighted that we have um, joining us today, Dr. Gillian Purden, who's Chief Nutritionist at Food Standards Scotland, um, and Laura Farrell, who is the Company Nutritionist at Tesco. Um, both of them will be um, sharing, um, uh, talking for uh, uh, briefly about um, the work that they're doing on specific areas within the Kids Food Guarantee. So um, Gillian will be talking about the work they're doing in Scotland um, uh, to restrict promotions of HFSS foods. And uh, Laura will be talking about the work they're doing at Tesco's to improve children's diets, specifically around yogurts, which is one of the categories that we um, interrogate within, within, within the guarantee. Um, so we are, Planning to have a Q&A uh, at the end. If you've got any questions, please pop them in the chat and um, we will endeavour to get to them at the end. Um, but without further ado, I will pass over to you, Rebecca. Thanks, Chloe. Are, the, are you moving the slides on? Yes. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I'm definitely going to put infamous in my LinkedIn profile now. <laughs> Um, uh, and it's really great to see so many of you here today. Um, so I'll just start just with a bit of sort of background and context to the Kids Food Guarantee. So we launched this last sort of March, April. So happy birthday to the Kids Food Guarantee, uh, one year old. Um, and it was very much born of the cost of living crisis. So what the Kids Food Guarantee is intended to do is function as a roadmap for retailers. So it's a set of actions that we think um, retailers should be doing in order to support low-income families, low-income customers through the cost of living crisis. Um, and at its heart, the Kids Food Guarantee is really about better pricing for health. Um, and it has sort of three main kind of, I guess, buckets or areas. Um, the first is all around making healthy essentials, staples affordable. Um, and this is very much targeted towards families who, you know, we know are sort of struggling full stop in terms of affording enough food and certainly healthy food. Um, so we look at things like fruit and veg and first infant formula within this uh, bucket. Um, the second bucket is all around supporting health for those feeling the squeeze. So this is not necessarily those households who are in the sort of very poorest group um, in the UK. But what we do know has happened a lot over the past year or so is that people have been trading down in price. But what we don't want to happen is that trading down in price means trading down in, in health. Um, so within this area, we look at those categories, those sort of popular items that you know families with kids are going to be buying and feeding their children and really trying to see whether the most affordable options within those categories are also the healthiest um, or not. Um, and finally, we've got a sort of longer term area that is really about kind of shifting the balance of the basket 
for towards sort of healthier and more sustainable diets in the long run and supporting uh, low income families through the Healthy Start scheme. Um, and what we've been doing over the past year is, is, as Chloe said, monitoring and tracking progress and performance by the retailers across those different areas. Um, and um, the reason we've got the, the areas that we have on this, um, you know, on this roadmap are they're both things that citizens have specifically told us they would like to see retailers doing, um, but they do also align with areas of focus for retailers or areas that they should be focusing on anyway. So, for example, we know a great deal of work has already happened to, to reformulate products like yogurts and cereals over the past few years. And, and most UK supermarkets have um, you know, sustainability and, and healthy sales targets. So the idea is that these areas sort of map onto existing activity anyway. Um, could you move the slide on, Chloe? Thanks. Um, as Chloe said, we've published a summary briefing um, today, and this pulls together all of the different reports and data from the last year. And um, it also includes a number of um, practical recommendations, both for industry, who obviously have a part to play here, um, but also policymakers, because they play a key role in um, ensuring that particularly low income groups, those on benefits, et cetera, are able to afford and access um, a healthy diet. Um, but they also set the parameters within which um, you know, supermarkets operate. Um, next slide, please. Um, so why the kids food guarantee? Well. I think the cost of living crisis is sort of less in the media um, as it was a year ago, but certainly the cost of food is still something that is keeping a lot of people up at night. Um, and I think it's important to note that even though food inflation is, is falling, that doesn't actually mean that prices that we pay when we're at the till um, or in supermarkets is falling. It just means that the price of food is rising less quickly than it was this time last year. Um, and actually what you see when you look at food prices two years ago is that food prices today are 25% are higher. Um, and we know that that is disproportionately affecting low income families in particular who have far less disposable income to spend um, on, on things like food. Um, and we can see this, this story is playing out really clearly when we look at food insecurity. Um, so we've been tracking levels of food insecurity at the Food, in, food Foundation since those sort of first very chaotic weeks of, of COVID and, and the lockdown. Um, and what you can see is that even though food insecurity levels um, peak kind of late summer, early autumn 2022, um, they very much kind of plateaued since then. Um, and what's particularly concerning is that households with children are at a much higher risk of food insecurity than households without children. So you can see 20% as of this January, versus 12% of households without children. Um, but within households with children, what's even more worrying is that those with very little kids, so, so kids and babies under four, have an even higher risk of food insecurity. Um, and so obviously good nutrition is important throughout the life course, but it's particularly worrying um, during those kind of very early years, because that is a really important window. Um, you know, it's, Nutrition is, is really critical in those first few years, both for um, sort of setting the foundations for sort of future health trajectories, um, but also it's a, it's a really kind of rapid period of growth and development. So, um, you know, not only do we want um, households with children and children to, to be able to access enough food, um, we also want them to be able to access enough nutritious food. And, um, you know, our data on food insecurity is shows that a lot of people are struggling to afford, you know, access enough food full stop but it's likely that the cost of living crisis is also impacting on, on dietary quality as well next slide please thanks oh <laughs> we just get thanks uh, so what we've done and what you can find in the summary briefing is we've we've mapped um, retailer performance across all the different areas we've looked at over the past year. Um, and what you can see is that there is actually some really nice progress happening, um, which is really encouraging to see. Um, but it's not happening at the pace or the scale that, that really we, we need it to be happening at. Um, and I think what's interesting as well is that there's quite a lot of inconsistency so that there's not a really clear story that comes out. You can see that between the retailers, but also even just between the different guarantee areas, there's, there's sort of an inconsistency there. So if you take someone like Iceland, um, they perform really strongly on, on those guarantee areas that look, you know, at supporting low income families and kind of social um, purpose, specifically like Healthy Start and First Infant Formula. 
but they perform more weekly when you look at areas that are around, for example, availability and affordability of nutritious food. Um, so I think across the board, you know, we, there's a real opportunity here for, for retailers to kind of raise the level of ambition here um, and really keep driving forward with progress. Um, what we did um, as part of this mapping exercise is, is we've highlighted in green uh, the supermarket with the sort of um, the, the strongest performance across the most number of areas. So well done, Tesco's. Um, Honourable mention as well to Sainsbury's, who performed strongly across a, a large number of, of areas as well. Um, and we see that Morrison's holds the greatest number of, of laggard positions across the different guarantee areas. So um, I guess in summary, lots of good stuff happening, but definitely scope to go, go further and at, at scale. Next slide, please. Um, what we're going to do now is just go in a little bit more detail and look at each of the different guarantee areas and what we found. Um, so starting off with fruit and veg. So I won't go into detail about why fruit and veg is, is so key. That's no doubt blindingly obvious to most of you on the call. Um, but I think it is important to note that fruit and veg is probably kind of the category, the group of foods where we see really notable dietary inequality so it is more expensive and harder for low-income families to access enough fruit and veg um, and so what we were interested in finding out as part of looking at this guarantee area was um, both how available and um, how affordable fruit and veg um, are so what we did is we looked um, across seven different supermarkets we looked at what were the the very lowest priced products that they offered um, when it comes to fruit and veg and we included not just fresh but also tinned and frozen um, and what we found is that actually when you take so we it was the cost of 35 portions of fruit and veg which is you know five uh, is but you're five a day for seven days um, with sort of 10 different types of fruit and veg so that you get, you know, some some diversity there. And, and we found that all the retailers offered competitively priced fruit and veg, um, but, there, but there is an income issue there. Um, and that's something that the government really needs to, to be focusing on, because what we found is that actually the cost of that um, 35 portions a week, but for the poorest 10 percent of households in the UK, um, that was almost half of, of the food budget for, for one person in that lowest income decile. So there's a real income issue there that it would be good to see the government addressing, for example, ensuring that, you know, the cost of affording a, a healthy diet is factored into to benefit and, and minimum wage levels. Um, what we also found that, that to me was actually quite surprising was that of those very lowest priced fruit and veg products, actually um, one in seven um, contained added salt or sugar, so 16% of, of the products. Um, and that was overwhelmingly driven by um, tinned fruit and veg products. So I think there's opportunity there to really kind of focus on what can be done within that category to, to sort of lower levels of, of added salt and sugar where possible. Um, you know, if, if you're a low income family and you're looking to really stretch your, your food budget, um, that is, is not great in terms of kind of the choice um, that's available to you in terms of, of healthy fruit and veg um, and foods. Um, we also, and I should say this was in no way nationally representative, but we did a sort of very rapid uh, kind of store, uh, set of store visits. So um, we visited 30 stores um, across the UK, uh, looking at six different retailers. So we went to stores in London, in Hull, in Great Malvern. And what we were trying to find out was actually of the sort of, um, so for each retailer we looked at, we took uh, 10 of the lowest priced fruit and veg products without added sugar. So a kind of healthy, low cost basket of fruit and veg, budget fruit and veg. Um, and we looked to see how many of those 10 items were actually available physically in, in stores. And actually just one store that we visited, which was a Tesco Superstore, um, had all 10 of those budget fruit and veg items um, stocked. Um, the, the kind of average number was five. Um, what was particularly concerning, I think, is that in, in the convenience store, express store formats, that figure was even lower. Um, and we know that low income families tend to be um, more dependent on those kind of smaller store formats than, than higher income families are. Um, next slide, please. And we also looked at multi-buys. Um, and so when I say multi-buys, I'm talking about sort of bog offs, buy one, get one free, volume promotions. Um, and I think it's important to say that, that not all retailers do have 
offer multi buys, uh, and that's fine. But but when multi buys are being offered, ideally, what we'd like to see happening is that those offers are on healthy staples rather than high fats or sugar, HFSS, um, food and drink. Um, and and we looked at three different time points uh, last year. And actually, the figures were kind of very consistent across those three time points. So we didn't see much, much change really happening. And what we saw is that over a quarter of multi-buy deals um, were on HFSS food and drink, so about 27%. Um, and just 4% were on fruit and veg uh, and 3% on staple carbohydrates. Um, and I think when you when you compare that to the Eat Well Guide and the, the proportion of foods that the Eat Well Guide recommends are sort of form part of that healthy diet, you can see there's a real kind of misalignment in terms of where promotional spend is going compared to dietary recommendations. Um, so kind of huge scope where multi-buys are offered to, to try and see what can be done to align that with, with dietary guidelines. Um, in the, the last of the reports we did on multi-buys, which used data from last August, um, we also looked at price promotions. Um, and price promotions are interesting because in England, they're actually not included within scope of the government's forthcoming HFSS legislation, which is going to um, hopefully come into play next year. Um, but we found that actually price promotions were not just more common, so kind of more frequently offered by retailers, but also a larger proportion of those offers um, went on HFSS food, so 41%. Um, and that is a perfect moment to, to introduce um, Dr. Gillian Purden. Uh, so ne next slide, Chloe. And we're delighted to have her here today. And she's going to talk to us a bit about the work that Food Standards Scotland and the Scottish Government have been doing um, on, on promotions. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Rebecca, and, and to the Food Foundation for the invitation to, to have just a really quick overview of, of some of the work that we've been doing recently. Um, but just very briefly, I thought I'd just remind people or let people know around about Food Standards Scotland. So we were established back in 2015 as a public food body for Scotland. We're independent of government and a really broad remit, but uniquely we have a statutory responsibility to improve diet in Scotland. So, and that's uh, the team that, that I head up. Um, our role requires that we advise Scottish government and ministers um, on actions to improve diet and all our uh, recommendations are underpinned by the science and evidence base but we also have a, a dietary monitoring program so we look at monitoring the Scottish dietary goals and, the, and, and evaluate basically the impact of nutrition policy within Scotland and many recommendations that we've given have been incorporated within Scottish government um, policy documents um, including the diet and healthy weight delivery and outform action plans so um, and I'll go on to talk a little bit about that in, in more detail in a sec. So um, just go move on to the next slide, please. Yeah, as we've heard just there, Rebecca, that was a really good overview of what's happening in this um, the retail food environment. We know that it's really heavily incentivizes those low cost foods, which over contribute to energy, fat, sat fat and free sugars. So if we can improve this food environment through the actions like that you're describing, but also through mandatory actions and make the healthy and affordable options um, available wherever we work, live, then really we've got the best chance of helping reduce health inequalities and help everyone live longer and healthier lives. And so when we look at our promotions data, I think the, the chart here is really complementary to the, the information that you've just been shown. Um, it really shows that those promotions are skewed towards the more unhealthy food categories. So here we've got food category level data and it's all types of promotions. So multi-buys, price promotions all, all lumped together. But you can see here total food and drink promotions um, in Scotland is around 20%. And whilst in the other food categories, there are a few healthier you know, categories like fish, rubbish free, but the majority are those unhealthy types and we would refer to many of them as discretionary food categories so not required at all in your diet and certainly not required for a healthy diet things like confectionery biscuits cakes you know sweet pastries and um, sugary drinks those types of things and so but they still contribute significantly to to uh, our diet so for, for this type of data and um, from part of the rationale why we recommended Scottish Government introduce measures to restrict unhealthy promotions and, and rebalance and these towards those healthier food categories. So very much complementing the asks of the Kids Food Guarantee. Um, our latest um, analysis of dietary intake showed that this, these discretionary categories that I've just mentioned um, count for about 15% of the calories we consume. So it's reasonably significant. 
But the Scottish Government are also considering um, restricting promotions of ad additional food categories that kind of aligned with those in England, um, looking at yoghurt from a free, ready meals, pizza, breakfast cereals and potato products, those types of things. And that could be a, a further around about 13% of overall calorie intake. So it's pretty significant overall. Um, so we've got there's an opportunity here to really um, impact quite a big proportion of our diet and encourage retailers to rebalance those promotions in favour of the healthier ones, but also to, to sort of reformulate as, as the Kids Food Guarantee wants to do some of those categories like the yogurts and fromage way to reduce um, particularly sugars um, and, and potentially fats and calories in some of those other product categories. So move on to the next slide, please. Great. So promotions um, are designed there to make us buy more than we might not have wanted to do in the first place. And it can actually be more expensive to begin with. So I know that quite a lot of the, the mantra in the media is that if we restrict promotions, then that's going to be a detrimental thing for consumers. But that's really not necessarily the case. Promotions tend to be often on more expensive items in the first place. And there are often cheaper alternatives available. Um, and there was an analysis done by Department of Health and Social Care, and they re they um, they estimate that these additional purchases could be as much as about eighteen percent. So it, it can be quite significant. As mentioned on the previous slide, um, and published in a recent report on the shopping um, patterns in the retail environment, our data shows about a fifth of all our shopping baskets are purchased on price promotion. So it's it's quite a lot. But the majority, as Rebecca just mentioned, are on these temporary price reductions, much less so on the um, multi-buy type um, promotions. And, and around 28% of those promotions are on discretionary products from the retail food environment. So it, that's also pretty significant. So really, if we can try and rebalance these promotions and make it easier for people to access healthier options, that really would um, help. The, the people in Scotland and the rest of the UK and the Scottish Government did a bit of modelling and they looked at even if we could reduce the promotions of the discretionary foods and that could that could save up to about 600 calories per person per week but also if we restrict other food categories that could save even more um, calories within the, um, the population's diet. So let's move on to the last slide. And just wanted to kind of finally highlight that in Scotland, we work very much um, in partnership with Public Health Scotland um, and Scottish Government, but with Public Health Scotland really to support diet implementation and monitoring. Um, and if you want to know a bit more about the data that I presented here, I'd really encourage you to have a look at this. Um, hopefully the, the links will work in the slide deck. It is a um, joint position statement that we published, and this was time to coincide with the launch of a consultation uh, on, on um, restriction of promotions within Scotland um, and it really outlines the evidence for action uh, to improve these measures but also more other measures more broadly to improve the environment in food environment in Scotland and as a devolved nation you know we have these within our powers so that's something that's it's really important that we get as many um, uh, responses as possible so I'd really um, encourage people to have a look at this um, Scottish Government looking at um, promotion of um, unhealthy promotions within positional sort of end of aisles and checkouts, as well as looking at different types of promotions, um, including price promotions as well as, as the, um, the sort of multi-buy deals. So um, if you could have a look at it, and I'd encourage people to share through other networks, um, you've still got time to respond as well. It's open until the 21st of May. So um, I think that's all for me. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions as well at the end. Anyone's got any? Thanks, Rebecca. And Chloe. Thanks, Julian. Great. Um, and yeah, just to say that consultation is, is still open um, for anybody keen to, to um, submit a response. Um, so moving back to looking at the kind of individual guarantee areas um, in detail. So um, one that we looked at quite recently was whole grain. So um, roughly about 50% of um, what the EY guide recommends people eat should be based around st staple carbohydrates. Um, and we know that um, whole grain, whole wheat versions of those staple car carbohydrates um, tend to be much more nutrient dense in large part because they're higher fiber. Um, so obviously no such thing as a superfood, but if there was, it would be fiber. Um, and uh, what we what we did with this guarantee area is we looked at four kind of staple carbohydrate categories. So we looked at bread, so loaves of bread, rice, pasta, and noodles. Um, 
And we looked first at the availability of those kind of whole grain, whole wheat options. And actually we found that the majority of available options were white and um, sort of unrefined products. So just 16%, um, so one in six of, of um, all those products that we looked at across those four categories were whole grain or whole wheat. Um, it was best for the bread category. So you obviously got kind of, um, you know, 50-50 whole grain uh, loaf options that are sort of often quite common. Um, but uh, it was not so great looking at rice and pasta. And it was even worse for noodles where we found just 6%. So a sort of handful of products um, noodle products that were whole grain or whole wheat. So I think there's definitely an opportunity for some of those other staple carbohydrate categories to, for um, retailers to really look at what they can do in terms of availability. And actually what was interesting is that when we compared between retailers, there was quite a lot of variability in terms of the offer. So Iceland, um, at one end of the spectrum, just 5.6% of their staple carbohydrate products for whole grain or whole wheat, compared to Sainsbury's, where almost a quarter, 24% of their available products in those four categories were whole grain or whole wheat. Um, we also then looked at price. So we were particularly interested in kind of direct equivalence here. So what we did was we took the kind of um, lowest price 10 um, uh, options within each of those four categories and then we looked at what was the cost of the the kind of nearest equivalent um, of sort of whole wheat version um, and the reason we did it this way is because we know that you know if, if, if we're thinking about how people are practically going to substitute one product for perhaps a healthier version it's going to be it's going to come down to habit preference and critically price so for example we took um, you know like a hovis white loaf of bread and then we looked at okay well what is the cost um, for the kind of equivalent brand, so like a ho Hovis whole grain loaf in a kind of similar size. And what we found was that actually there was a price differential, so whole grain options cost more across the board. And um, the smallest price difference was in the bread category, um, where um, whole grain uh, products cost about 9p on average more than the white equivalent. Um, but it was largest for the rice category, where the um, whole grain brown rice options were about 77p more. Um, so there's definitely opportunity here, both in terms of availability, but also in terms of um, looking to focus on pricing to ensure that, you know, um, if, if we're going to encourage people to, to switch to whole grain, whole wheat, more nutrient dense versions of carbohydrates, that that is um, easy for them to do. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the sort of final product um, category that we looked at within this kind of bucket of the kids food guarantee was first infant formula. Um, and it's worth giving a bit of kind of context to first infant formula. So for, for, for babies who are aged under six months, there, there really is no alternative other than breast milk or first infant formula. So for those families who are relying on formula to feed their babies, um, for whatever reason, it is really, really critical that that, that price point is, is affordable for those families. And, um, you know, what we don't want to happen is that families end up skipping feeds or um, diluting that product to try and make it stretch further um, because that comes with, with very significant risks um, for obvious reasons to, to young infants and, and babies' health. Um, so we've been tracking the price of first infant formula since since last June. Um, and what we found and is really interesting is that there actually there is actually a lot of variation in price, both when you look at different brands of first infant formula but even when you look at the same brand when stocked across different retailers. Um, so you can see on this graph, there's a kind of long tail of pricing um, ranging. So this data is from February, but when we looked at it more recently um, in April, there was still a 77% price difference between the cheapest first infant formula available and the most expensive. But you can see here um, at one end of the spectrum, you've got um, Aldi's Mamiya brands, which at the time was retailing for um, $8.99. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got an Aptamil product that at co-op was retailing for £14. Um, and that price difference is significant um, because, uh, as you may expect, first infant formula, for obvious reasons, is, is very tightly regulated. So it has to meet certain sort of minimum standards of, of nutritional adequacy. And so that means that first infant formula all the products have to be nutritionally comparable. So it is concerning that there is such a sort of price differential. Um, next slide, please. Um, 
it is actually one of the, I would say of all the guarantee areas, it's the area where we've seen the most progress being made, which is really, really positive to see. And I think it's actually a really nice example of what happens when you get different food system stakeholders working in tandem. So um, it's obviously been quite prominent in the media over the past year or so. Lots of NGOs have been doing lots of active campaigning on the issue. And um, you've also had the Competition and Markets Authority, so a sort of government body looking at the issue. They published a report last November um, kind of highlighting that costs um, seem to have been raised above input costs. Um, and you've also had businesses um, who sort of acting on this. So Iceland are a good example of this. They've, they've been sort of actively campaigning on the issue since, since last summer. Um, and what we've seen as a result is we have seen the whole kind of category shift in terms of pricing, which is really positive. Um, so what happened in January is um, Danone cut the cost of their optimal brand. And you can see that immediately come through if you look at the graph you can see the price of optimal starts to drop across all, all retailers and i think um that does speak to the important role that manufacturers do play in this category and that relationship between you know what level retailers can price stuff at and what what is the price they're, they're buying in from manufacturers so in the uk there's um four manufacturers that that um dominate that market so between them nestle and danone have about 85 percent of of the share so it's been really positive to see both Danone and later Nestle's SMA Little Steps brand kind of reduced the, the price there. Um, you can see, oh, sorry, thank you. Um, you can see um, cost to Iceland. So Iceland have really led the way in terms of, of businesses acting on this. So last August, they cut the cost of um, formula they stocked to, to cost price, so i.e. little to no profit margin for them. Um, and, and they remain very competitive in terms of pricing. Um, there is currently there is only one own label uh, sort of supermarket brand a formula available on the market, um, which is Aldi's Mamia brand, and we've also seen the cost of that reduce over the past few months. So all very promising. Um, the CMA have another report coming out this September looking at formula specifically, um, and I think it'd be very interesting to see what what is included in that but i think certainly there there are probably questions and and maybe one for discussion about whether this category should be treated as an exception and and whether it is one that we should leave to the market to price or whether there needs to be sort of greater intervention uh, next slide please um and then moving on to yogurt so we we've spent a lot of the last year talking about yogurt at the food foundation um i'm obsessed with yogurt now um but what we what we looked at was um single serving pots of yogurt and the reason we chose single serving pots of yogurt is if you think about how how families are likely to shop you know it's much you're much more likely to be looking for kind of pots of yogurt to include in lunch boxes or um to have kind of out and about they're much more snackable than large pots um and what we found is that actually the very cheapest yogurts were not the lowest in sugar. Um, so the very kind of cheapest yogurts, and you can find some very competitively priced yogurt, but the cheap, cheapest pots tend to be, um, if you were thinking in terms of kind of traffic light, amber, there are some medium kind of levels of sugar. Um, but when we looked at kind of the very healthiest yogurts, so um, plain unsweetened yogurts, um, there was a sort of dearth of, of options there. Um, so we found actually just 14 um, products that are sort of plain, unsweetened, single serving yogurt pots. And that's from a sample of um, about 370 yogurts overall. Um, and, and what you can see from this graph is that there's also a price premium there. So the plain, unsweetened yogurts were about 26 percent more expensive than um, sweetened, flavoured yogurts. So I think there's huge opportunity there um, for retailers to, to firstly kind of con continue their good work in reformulating yogurt, but also think about about what can be done, particularly with regards to those sort of plain unsweetened yogurt versions, given that most uh, the dietary recommendations for children, um, young children recommend sort of very small, if, if any levels of, of uh, free sugar content, uh, sorry, free sugar intake. Um, and on that note, I'm really happy to introduce um, Laura Farrell from Tesco's. He's gonna chat a bit about all the work that Tesco's have been doing um, specifically on yogurt. Thanks, Rebecca, and thanks to the Food Foundation for letting us have some time to talk to you today about our work on supporting our customers with healthier diets. At Tesco, we very much recognise the role we have to play in health, and it's, an ambition, it's our ambition to be the most convenient place to shop for healthy, more sustainable food at an affordable price. 
Our role in this area has never been more critical. And in 2021, we set out our plans to help customers eat more healthily. Central to our focus is our target of increasing sales of healthy products as a portion of volume to 65% by 2025. And I'm pleased to say that we are on track to achieve this up from our 2019 baseline of 58%. But supporting customers make healthier choices isn't about enforcing big changes or telling them what to do. Instead, we're focusing on the little helps that help fit into their lifestyles and how they shop. To help us reach our target, we've adopted an approach that looks at tackling the things that customers tell, tell us are the biggest barriers they come up against, keeping it affordable, making healthy eat, eating easier and make it more relevant and inspiring. And for me, the ultimate test here is about what we're doing to support families in, and in turn, children's health. I'm pleased to talk to you today about our journey on children's yogurts. Across our yogurts category, we've been reducing sugar in our own level product range. Within that, children's yogurts have been a particular focus. This has been both for public health and customer demand. When we asked about yogurts, over 70% of our customers are concerned about the amount of sugar present in yogurts. Our own label ranges have for a long time had much lower sugar levels than the branded counterparts, while being fortified and priced at a, a lower price than the brands and competitively, competitively within their market. Last year, we were the first retailer to launch an own label flavoured yogurt that was no added sugar, low in sugar, fortified with vitamin D, and importantly, it's priced lower than the branded alternative to tackle that well-known barrier for customers moving into healthier choices, which is price. However, for us to really help customers access low sugar alternatives, we know we need to take a total category approach speaking with both brands and our own label suppliers. For a few years now, we've actually created joint health plans whereby we have the aim of reducing sugar sold within the category. This can be through a formulation and in introducing more no added sugar options. And importantly, we track this co collectively. We are very much so still on a journey, but we've already had some really good successes here. Between 2022 and 2023, across the category, so brands and own label, we've removed 64 tonnes of sugar. To contextualise that, that's about the weight of 10,000 elephants. We're now, now the market leader for offering no added sugar children's yoghurt options too. But in all honesty, this really hasn't come easy and we are really facing challenges to accelerate this. Earlier I mentioned about the customers concerned about sugar, that over 70% of our customers are worried about the sugar content in their yoghurts. We, we have significantly increased the number of those no added sugar products available but customers are continue, aren't making that switch that we want to see. That volume isn't really coming through on those lines. It's really much lower. So this is an example of what we see, what we call in the industry is the they do gap, which is something we see more widely in health anyway. Customers are asking us to do things and saying that they'll act one way, but in reality, it just doesn't happen. This isn't deterring us though. And by Tesco creating a known brand offer is a testament to our dedication to improving choices within this category. In fact, this category is a category where we're already 100% healthy sales, i.e. we've got 100% of our products within that category with a healthy NPM score, but we still believe we can help further. We continue to work with our suppliers across that category to break down those barriers so we can collectively reach the overall goal of healthier children's yogurts. We have lots more coming in this space, including the role of plain yogurt, which sadly I can't share now and haven't got time for. But I hope we can share this in time, if anything, to inspire others to see what can be done when we work together. I'll stop there. But just before I do, once again, a big thank you to the Food Foundation for letting me share our experience. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the session. I'll hand back to Rebecca now. Thanks, Laura. Um, uh, so moving on to look at cereals. Um, so cereals, obviously, another product that is kind of a, a staple for a lot of families um, can be a good source of nutrition, but don't aren't always necessarily that uh, or what we want them to be. And I think um, I think picking up on some of what Laura was saying about the challenges is that retailers have, you know, that they're not just selling own label products, but also branded products. Cereals was an area where actually it was a, a, a success story for the retailers in that um, over Overwhelmingly, kind of the cheapest options that were also more healthier were retailer own label products. Um, so, kind of across the category as a whole, of all the cereals we looked at, there's still a large proportion. Um, so, about a third were um, HFSS. So, there's obviously a need to kind of 
across the whole category look at improving the the, the um, pro nutrition profile of those cereals. Um, what was really nice to see is that actually supermarket owned brand cereals, they both offered um, customers kind of the most competitively priced options by quite some way compared to branded cereals. But what we also did um, in our last cereal report is we looked at um, the kind of best sellers. So, for example, we compared Nestle Shreddies to um, supermarket own label versions, which are called things like malted Wheaties or Maltese. Um, and what we saw is that the supermarket versions were not only cheaper per 100 grams, but they were also much healthier. So they had better um, scores using the NPM model. Um, so the worst offenders really, um, when we look at this uh, area, are the kind of branded products, so Nestle and Kellogg cereals. Um, in fact, there's one uh, Kellogg cereals that we looked at that, um, so uh, for a product to be find as HFSS, it has, it is, if it has an NPM score higher than four, and this particular cereal had an NPM score of 18. Uh, so uh, there's a real opportunity and a, and a need for um, particularly branded cereals to really continue and um, up the pace at which they're working on kind of reformulating um, those products. Next slide, please. Um, and then moving on to lunch boxes. So I'm um, happy to say we've got a new report that was published this morning. So you may have seen it um, in the press today. We've had some good uh, press coverage. Um, and what this uh, guarantee area looks at is um, healthy lunch boxes. So um, what we've done with this uh, kind of area is we took, so I should say there are no formal or kind of official uh, guidelines for what a healthy lunchbox should look like, even though we know that a lot of children are taking packed lunches into school. Um, so there's, there's 900,000 children living in poverty who are not currently eligible for the government's free school meal scheme. And that means that those children are reliant on packed lunches and we can assume that their families have limited budget to spend on items to go into those packed lunches. And um, so what we did is we took a sort of um, a group of, of products sort of indicative of what a healthy lunchbox could look like. Um, and then what we've done is we've looked at the cost of that um, on a sort of per portion basis um, across the five major UK supermarkets um, and actually what we've seen is that since we started monitoring this at the start of the last academic year at four out of five retailers the price of the items in that healthy lunch box have actually increased um, and, and what we did in, in the report that's been published today is we also asked, OK, well, well what is the cost of a, a less healthy equivalent to that lunchbox? So what we did is we substituted the products in that lunchbox. So instead of um, um, a plain unsweetened yogurt, you have a sweetened yogurt. Instead of a, um, a cheese sandwich, you have a chocolate spread sandwich and so on and so forth. And actually, what was really concerning to see is there is a price differential there. So the healthy lunchbox actually costs more um, on a per portion basis than the less healthy lunchbox. And there was quite a significant variation there. So Tesco's had the, the smallest price differential between the healthy version of the lunchbox and the least healthy at 9%. And Aldi had the largest at 77%. Um, what we'd really like retailers to do is to um, offer an equivalent to, you know, adult meal deals are, are very common, grab and go kind of lunch options where you get a collection of items for one price that make up a, a lunch. Um, we, we think there's huge opportunity for retailers to do something similar for school lunch boxes. Um, no retailer currently has such a deal. So um, there you go. There's an opportunity for any retailers on the call. Um, next slide, please. Um, and finally, the Healthy Start Scheme. Um, so the Healthy Start Scheme, for those of you not familiar with it, is a, is a government scheme and it's um, highly targeted towards um, low income families with very little kids. So those aged four and under. Um, and what it provides is funds every week um, that families can spend on healthy essentials. So fruit, veg. Uh, milk, first infant formula, and uh, uh, beans and pulses. Um, and there's lots of really nice examples here, actually, of, of retailers um, supporting the scheme. Um, since the scheme was digitized in early 2022, um, it's been very difficult from a kind of practical perspective for retailers to add monetary value to the scheme, as many of them did during the pandemic. Um, but there is still a huge opportunity for retailers to really lean in in terms of promoting the scheme. Um, and we'd like to see more activity happening there in, you know, in lieu of being able to add monetary value. Um, some nice case studies just to mention. So Iceland 
um, relabeled all their own brand milk bottles. And also this year, lots of different fruit and veg lines with information about the scheme. Um, Sainsbury's um, last year ran a kind of two pound uh, top up uh, scheme whereby um, anyone redeeming their healthy start card in store gets a little voucher to spend on fruit and veg at their next shop. Um, so, so lots of nice activity. Um, uptake for the scheme is really low and has been for a while. So about a third of families eligible for this scheme on on it um, and that is is really something that needs to be addressed there's much more the government need to be doing to support the scheme um, that's that's a different webinar <laughs> but certainly um, when it comes to retailers and um, we'd really like to see kind of more being done both to raise awareness but also I think there's a lot that can be done at a kind of more targeted local level so for example we have data at a kind of local authority level that can help us identify you know where are the areas where lots of families are eligible for the scheme but not currently on it is there stuff that you know local stores could be doing working in tandem with public health teams to really drive up uptake um can uh, communication be personalized through customer loyalty schemes to low-income customers um there's certainly lots of opportunity to really um further support the scheme um next slide please and I think this is um, coming on to the final slides before we open up the conversation to you all. Um, but I think just to conclude again and say, you know, we have seen progress being made, but just not at the pace or the scale that it needs to be. And we really want to see that level of ambition being raised across across the board. Um, there is, um, you know, there's both a need for government to support um, low income families to access um, enough and, and healthy food um, and, and much more that retailers and manufacturers because I think we've seen um, through a number of those categories that manufacturers also play a key role here um, to ensure that kind of lower income households and households feeling the squeeze are able to access and afford healthy products you know in an ideal world these would be you know priced at the same or lower than less healthy equivalents they'd be more appealing they'd feature in more promotions and they'd just generally be an easier option um, for families to choose than they currently are um i I think, could you move on a slide, please? And um, just to say as well, we have um, a Kiss Food Guarantee dashboard. So if you go into the data hub section of our website, um, maybe someone can pop the link in. There's a whole wealth of um, longer term report, uh, fuller uh, reports on each of these guarantee areas, lots and lots of graphs. We love a good graph um, and uh, just generally much more information there. And we're really keen that lots of people do start to use this data because there is quite a lot that we've built up there now over the course of the past year. Um, and I just wanted to say, if you could move on to the next slide, just a thanks to our partners. So uh, we work with Question Mark on several uh, guarantee areas within the Kids Food Guarantee. They're um, a Dutch uh, think tank and they've uh, supported us with a lot of the data that's kind of sat behind a lot of these reports. So. Big thanks to Question Mark for their support too. Um, and back to you, Chloe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, that, even though I knew all that information, I was still nodding, nodding along, found it really, really interesting. Um, thank you also, Gillian, um, for your contribution. Laura has had to dash. She's in an all-day meeting. Um, but yeah, really appreciate Rebecca and Gillian for staying staying on for um, some questions um, now. Um, I um, we've had a um, just a bit of a technical question for you, Rebecca. Uh, Barbara Crafter has asked. I know has it been answered already? Oh yeah, no, I can, yeah. I can speak to it. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it's just come down to capacity, really. So in an ideal world, we'd be monitoring all of the retail against all of the guarantee areas um, but that hasn't always been possible so um, certainly in our most recent reports we did include kelp and iceland as you say they're kind of discounters or, or, or often used by kind of low income groups so important to to include um, so where we haven't been able to look at all retailers we we usually took the approach of looking at those with the, the largest um, market share so the big five okay Thank you. Um, and uh, Gillian, the, you mentioned the uh, the consultation that you've got open still. Um, I know we've got uh, one of we've got someone from the Scottish Government, Cheryl, on the on the call. And I just wanted to give her the opportunity to maybe say if, uh, say a few words about the consultation and go into it in a bit more detail. So, so Cheryl, I'll bring you in now. If if you are able to unmute yourself, I can't see you, but yeah. 
Is she on the line? Maybe not. Okay, all right. Well, no worries. You got we we have shared the link to the consultation already in the chat. So I would urge everyone to go there. Um, and you've got until the twenty first of May, right? Before um before it closes. So final few days to have your say. Um, but yeah, um, I guess question for you, Jillian. I was um really interested. Uh about Scotland Scotland's proposals are much wider in scope than than England's proposals and also a little bit wider in scope than than Wales's and I was just wondering kind of what drove that point of differentiation that's a good question I think I would I would like to see the evidence uh, Cheryl has come back in the chat just to say she, oh, she's there, but she can't unmute so I don't know if that's we were having uh, that problem earlier at the start so I don't know if that's um so I think in answer to your question, we know that um, that the retailers, and, and it's a shame that Tesco aren't here, and Laura's had to drop off, would probably prefer us to be aligned across the UK. But when we see the data pointing to things like the price promotion being much more widespread than the multi-buys, and it's still having a negative impact in terms of encouraging those purchases of the more unhealthy types of food categories or the discretionary food categories, that's why we, our evidence points to also including that at least as, as part of the consultation and that's what's happening. And also looking at things like meal deals, which can be good, but also have, can also encourage purchase of the, some of the unhealthy items as well. So that incorporating that within the consultation too. Um, I think that it's been pretty important that these, you know, where the evidence points to, um, these should be at least looked at. Um, how that is taken forward will depend on, on what comes back from the consultation. And obviously it'll be a ministerial decision and um, and it because it's a it's a Scottish government plus we advise policy at Scottish government that will will take that policy policy and forwards but we'll use our data to um you know outline the case and then as as the policy progresses to to continue to support that with data along the way and, and it's really helpful with some of this additional data that's coming out from the food foundation that could potentially also be used I know that this will be England but we do see very similar kind of patterns across the UK so it's probably very similar and um, so I don't know if we can get Cheryl into a bit more detail in the consultation but if not we can might just be maybe could someone send Cheryl a panelist link Roz I don't know if you could that maybe that is easier if we are not able to unmute her yeah hopefully I think we yeah, are hopefully uh, she, she can get a panelist link. Um, but if not, then maybe uh, what you've covered and the link to the consultation will be enough for the moment. But yeah, um, thank you, Gillian. It's good, it's good to know that the, the KFG data has been <laughs> been useful though in, in helping to inform the um, the kind of yeah the proposed um, restrictions. Um, uh, so, well, I wonder if you, you could also ask answer the question that's come in from um, someone, either you or Rebecca, but um, can you clarify the difference between price promotions versus multi-buys? 41% of price promotions on HFSS, but over 25% on multi-buy deals on HFSS. Yeah, I can clarify that. I think it's our data. Um, yeah, it's just a different type of promotion. So um, multi-buys are, so for example, buy one, get one free. Um, so that they're, they're based on volume, whereas price promotions would be sort of temporary price discounts, like this product was five pounds, now four pounds fifty. So they're, they're just sort of different types of, of promotion. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Una from Tesco is actually also here. Um, uh, um, could answer ask uh, answer some of the questions that have been put in the chat to Tesco, but bring you in, Una. Uh, someone's been asking um, uh, about the, the kind of the mark, the, the labelling of children's yogurts and wonder, and uh, can yogurts just be marketed, marketed in general as yogurts, as opposed to children's yogurts? We may have the same issue in terms of not being able to unmute, unmute Una. Okay, no worries. Um, so uh, 
final question for you then, Rebecca. There's lots of questions, um, there's lots of asks that we have in the briefing. The briefing is now, um, I should, should say, uh, is now being published. Uh, so head to the website um, and you can see it. It's also, I think, uh, the link has been shared in the chat. Um, but there are lots of asks of businesses, um, but what would you like to see from government? Oh, a juicy question. Um, <laughs> I think the Healthy Start Scheme just feels like such a good way of hitting off a number of these different areas. You know, it's it's targeted towards low-income families, particularly those with really little kids. It's focused on, you know, healthy staples, fruit and veg, first and formula, pulses, um, and it, it is in desperate need of, of, of more love, really. So, you know, as I said, uptake is currently at about 62%. It's been stuck at that level for quite a number of years now. Um, partly, there's people just aren't aware of it. There's also, you know, the, um, the level at which the funds are set at um, hasn't been increased since early 2021. So it hasn't kept pace with food prices. So the amount um, of food that you're able to get for, 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 the, for those funds is, um, you know, it's, it's been stretched. Um, and I think what's interesting is that when you compare the Healthy Start scheme to the Scottish version of the scheme, the Best Start scheme, uh, in Scotland, um, the amount has increased in, in, in line with inflation. So it's now over, um, it's, there's quite a difference in terms of the amount that families are receiving, but um, partly a result of that and, and promotion and communication of the scheme, uptake is much higher, it's at 92%. Um, so there's definitely more that, that really would be great to see being done to, to really um, kind of build and, and scale the Healthy Start scheme. Thank you. And also just quickly then, someone's asked, asking, what is the current uptake on Healthy Start? I think it's about 62%. 60%. Um, great. Well, uh, we will um, wrap up um, and just want to say thanks very much again to uh, Gillian um, and also to Laura for joining us and obviously to Rebecca um, for all of the stellar work that you've been doing for the last year. Um, and I encourage everyone to go to the dashboard, uh, dig in um, to the data and the various reports that we've been doing um, and uh, enjoy the rest of your days. Bye bye.